Hello, dear listener. Cherie here, host and producer of Strides Forward. Before we get on to this episode, I wanted to tell you about another podcast I think you'd enjoy. It's called She Runs Trails, and it was created to give voice to female mid-pack and back-of-the-pack trail runners who are doing incredible things out on the trail every single day. She Runs Trails is ideal for newer and veteran trail runners alike, as well as trail-curious road runners. Hosted by Melody Downlearn, who did not find trail running until age 40, this podcast covers a range of issues from nutrition, gear, ultra running, and mental health. Check out She Runs Trails podcast the next time you go for a run, or you can find Melody's latest book, The Beginner's Guide to Successful Trail Running, at sherunstrails.com. Okay, now on to the episode. Forward, forward, forward. It's 2017, sometime between June and October. An elite South African ultra distance runner, Anne Ashworth, realized something that would set her life path in a new direction. And I was sort of like, well, how come there are men's only teams, but there's no ladies only teams? That doesn't seem very fair. Anne is specifically referring to the fact that there were no elite, women's-only, long-distance running teams in South Africa. And by long distance, we're talking about marathons, which are 26.2 miles, or 42.2 kilometers, or longer. And those longer races are called ultramarathons or ultras. You're listening to Strides Forward, the podcast about long-distance running and the women who compete in the sport. My name is Cherie Louise Turner, and I'm your host and producer. This season is dedicated to experiences in and around the oldest and largest ultramarathon in the world, South Africa's 90-kilometer or 56-mile Comrades. Comrades turns 100 years old in 2021, and over 27,000 runners had registered for the 2020 event. Usually, each episode focuses on one runner— But for this episode, I'm doing something a little different. This is the story of a team and empowering women through sport. But before I get to that, a bit about Anne Ashworth and also about the significance of ultra running in South Africa, especially comrades. Anne was featured in our previous episode, which tells her story of striving for victory at Comrades. It's one of the most prestigious ultra-distance races in the world, and it's South Africa's crown jewel in the sport. And in fact, Comrades is one of the biggest sporting events in South Africa, period. The best American analogy I can find here as to the prestige of this event in South Africa is that it's sort of like the Super Bowl... If the Super Bowl were on TV live for 13 hours straight, and if it had been around for 99 years, and if there were over 20,000 participants, and if that included women, and those women received equal prize money. Cheryl Wynn, the chairperson of Comrades, spoke to the importance of the race in a June 3rd, 2020 episode of the podcast Marathon Talk. She said... It's really become part of our national heritage. Comrades Day is an unofficial national holiday. Further, the perception in South Africa of running comrades is very different from the perception of running ultras in many other parts of the world. In the U.S., for instance, the common reaction to someone running further than a marathon is, that's crazy. And most people wouldn't even consider the possibility of running that far. In South Africa, the attitude is quite the opposite. To return to the words of Cheryl Wynn in her Marathon Talk interview, she said, There's a saying, at least once in your life. South Africans should at least once in your life experience the Comrades Marathon. So this is the environment that Anne is operating in. What you need to know about Anne Ashworth for this episode is, at the time our story begins, between June and October 2017, She had spent the previous year focused on becoming much more serious about her running, and this had involved a lot of sacrifices. She'd quit her job and shifted her career so that she could prioritize running, which was a big financial risk. She'd also seriously ramped up her training with a new coach, 
all with the goal of having a breakthrough performance at the 2017 Comrades, which took place on June 3rd. And when she lined up for the race, she was in the best shape of her life. But within 700 meters of the start, she pulled a hamstring, and she was out. A year of dedication and sacrifice dashed. Anne was devastated, but she also had a deep passion for comrades and for the sport. She was also driven by something else. I've been raised to help people. I think that we have a moral obligation to do everything that we can to assist other people. And so if there's a way that I can assist somebody else, then I, I need to do that. And the second thing that I've, that I've always been raised to believe is that each of us are capable of making a difference. So I identified, hey, where can I make a difference? What, what can I do to make a difference here in South Africa? And, you know, I wasn't going to start a, a charity or an NGO or like, I mean, I don't have the means, knowledge or skill to do that. There's basically only two things I know how to do. One is to be an attorney or an advocate, and the other is to be a runner. And so I had to choose of these two things, which am I going to do? Where am I going to make my difference? And I decided to make the difference in running because it's something that I'm passionate about and it's something that I can share in. So Anne had a drive to make a difference. She had also noticed that there were men's only teams, but no women's only teams. Now, mind you, there were co-ed elite running squads, and those had men's and women's teams within the same organization. So elite female racers had a path to team membership and support. But there was something else that struck Anne about the way things were. Looking at the results at Comrades, I could also just see that the South African men did so much better at Comrades relative to the South African women. Um, and I thought, well, maybe if we had some more women's only teams focused on comrades, then the results at comrades would reflect more South African women in the top of the results. And this led Anne to deciding how she would give back. Here, Anne mentions Two Oceans, a 56-kilometer or 35-mile race, which in addition to comrades is the other premier ultra event in South Africa. And so decided that I was going to make it my mission to um, start a team of ultra distance focused female athletes who could really just focus on improving their marathon times and then moving on to improving their comrades and to oceans time. So in the ultra distance space. Something important to keep in mind here is that Anne wanted to bring more women into the elite ranks. Like she said, she wanted to see more South African women in the top of the results. She wasn't interested in pulling together some sort of all-star team of athletes who were already doing well, who were already on an elite team. So she was going to be searching for runners with untapped potential, athletes who hadn't gotten the results she believed they were capable of. And she knew those athletes were out there because she was aware of some of the factors that were holding them back. Athletes in South Africa, particularly disadvantaged athletes in South Africa, will try to run for money, run for prize money as a means of supplementing their income. And what that means is that they race too often, trying to chase easily available cash, and their performance suffers as a result. Anne also recognized factors that specifically hinder women. Women have two particular challenges um, at ultra distance running. The first is a safety concern, particularly for athletes who, who live and train in more rural areas or in townships. It's not safe for them to run alone, and they will struggle to find people that they can run with who are of their level, of their fitness or speed, or interested in the same races, and so um, so that's that's the first that's the first major concern, um, and the second the second major concern is childcare. Uh, you know we still live in quite a patriarchal society here. Women are tasked, um, well, many women are tasked with looking after their children. Many women are single mothers, and so how will they train 
enough hours to compete as an ultra distance runner if they need to look after their children who's going to look after them and and so those are two major factors influencing the rise particularly of disadvantaged athletes in the ultra distance space with these many hurdles in the way extra support would very likely help improve the abilities of athletes who had talent and drive but were lacking the guidance support and encouragement they needed But there are reasons this lack exists. For starters, to create an elite sports team, you need funding, which usually comes from sponsors, and sponsors are looking for exposure. Sponsors are also not particularly attracted to ultra-distance running because we can only run a couple of races a year. Um, So they don't get much bang for their buck in terms of race publicity. Um, so, So it is a difficult environment. Putting this all together, if, as a competitive long-distance runner, you race too often, your performance will suffer. But if you only race a few times a year so that you can prepare well and then recover properly, you miss out on prize money and you're not very appealing to sponsors. So what you need is a long-term support system that is okay with minimal exposure. That was Anne's first major challenge. She was also forming an all-women's team, which can be a tough sell, too. And as we know, she wanted to create her elite team by developing non-elite runners, those runners with untapped potential. Also unlike other elite squads that bring in foreign talent, Anne was focused only on South Africans. So her plan, to be clear, was to ask for enough money to fully fund a group of women that wouldn't race much and was considered among the elite ranks of ultra-running at least, a bunch of no-names. And further still, Anne herself wasn't yet considered a top contender in the elite ultra-world either. Remember, she just dropped out of the 2017 Comrades after less than five minutes of running. And previous to that, her best place at Comrades was 13th, outside of the highly coveted top 10. So with that, Anne set out on her quest for a title sponsor. Um, and so approached MassMart, which is a subsidiary of Walmart, and went to them with this idea, and they loved it. They were all for um, female empowerment. They were all for getting involved in South African sport. They were particularly attracted to, um, to running because it, it's such an easily accessible sport, and it's one of the most popular sports in our country. And they just got on board and they said, what do you need? How can we help you? And, and basically agreed to sponsor a team of elite athletes to try and get, um, you know, try to stimulate this surge of ultra distance running um, in, in the lady space in South Africa. It never hurts to ask. So now that Anne had secured the financial support she needed, it was time to construct her team. And Anne set to a self-made, laborious process to make sure she could identify just the sort of athletes she had in mind. Women who had a lot of potential, but who had been overlooked. Women who needed some steady support to go from good to great. Here, Anne mentions Strava, which is like Facebook, but for athletes. It's an app that provides details like how far and how fast someone ran, It also logs what are called segments. These are parts of running routes, and Strava keeps track of the time it takes anyone using the app to cover route segments. For each segment, there is a leaderboard divided by gender, so runners can see who's the fastest and also how they themselves rank in the standings. This has developed into a fun inter-Strava competition with athletes taking segments from each other by running faster times, or it's used as a way to see how you stack up against known faster runners in your area. For Anne, it proved useful in another way. I was a bit of a stalker. <laughs> I um, I logged onto Strava and had a look at what people were, you know, running around me, especially if someone took one of my segments. So I'd immediately like go into their profile and be like, who is this athlete taking my segment you know, is, is she any good? Does she does she run often? What else has she done? Um, and kind of once someone had come up on my feed, I'd also go, I trawled through two years worth of race results across all distances and kind of picked up about 20 
athletes that I thought, you know, like these are my, my cutoff was they cannot already belong to an elite club. And my primary determinant was the correlation between the different distances that they raced. So if I looked at their 10K time, their 21K time, their marathon time, and then their comrades in two oceans times, how relative were their results? So if they were doing very well in the 10K and the 21K and the marathon, but then didn't do so well in the ultra distance, why was that? And in the vast majority of cases, it came down to training. They just weren't training properly. And if I could see potential for us to move them up in their ultra distance time based on their shorter distance results, then I recruited them to the team. And then she set her program in motion. My primary concern was to identify up and coming talent, coach them, give them everything that they needed to run, um, not full time, all of all of our athletes work full time, but whatever running related support we could give them and then provide them with a retainer or a basic income stream, which meant that they didn't have to chase prize money. And by doing that, they could save themselves for major races, they could peak and condition properly, and then perform really well at things like comrades. By October 2017, Anne had solidified Team MassMart. She could assure that her athletes would receive steady support, and not have to over-race. But as the team was coalescing, she had another crucial concern to address. My experience has been, and, and it is changing, the culture is changing, but my experience has been, particularly amongst elite athletes in South Africa, that it's not a very nice environment. I think because sponsorship is so incredibly limited, it creates a very competitive environment, but not in a positive way. Um, and that, that's almost been encouraged by the older elite clubs, where there is very much a winner-takes-all approach to sponsorship. So, for example, the top female athlete in an elite club will earn more than twice the monthly retainer than the athlete that comes second. And that has been, it's been structured that way to make sure everybody's trying to be the best, but it doesn't exactly foster a sense of team spirit. And so because of the way that sponsorship and historically the teams have been managed here in South Africa, it just, it just doesn't create an environment in which sportsmanship is your go-to, but it should be. So Anne implemented a vision for a different type of dynamic and structure. I don't think that you'll find, well, I know that you won't find another team that operates according to those principles. We, we're all equal. We all come from the same place. We're all going to the same place. We all work together. Um, and we're very much into, into that, that kind of arrangement. And this team's communal support extended beyond the elite squad. So each elite athlete then becomes a mentor of a sub-elite athlete um, or, or um, just a non-elite athlete. And the idea there is that the athletes will meet up once a month, at least once a month, um, have coffee, chat about races, chat about goals, chat about any problems, and those problems can be running related or otherwise, whether they're personal problems or financial problems, whatever it is, just to really offer friendship and support. Offering friendship and support. These are threads that began to weave through how this Johannesburg or Joburg-based team operated. And these ties were strengthened by shared experiences. In South Africa, we're quite individualist. And if we do train, it's mostly... Um, based on, on where you live, you know, and, and your, the people that are in your immediate neighborhood that you can run with. But Team MassMod, we're from all over Joburg, but we make an, an effort to get together and run together and train together when we can. And it's just a hugely supportive environment, and it's fantastic. The team came together in other ways, too, like at races and not just the big key events. They chose lower-priority races to do together as hard training efforts. 
This is common practice for competitive athletes. It's a way to test fitness and an opportunity to feed off the competitive atmosphere at a race and also to feed off the energy of other athletes by running in a group or what South Africans call a bus. It's such a great environment because we can all just help each other out, identify, you know, and identify each other's troubles, help with each other's troubles and concerns. We're hugely supportive. We're hugely chatty. You know, if we all go to a race and we're doing it as a training one, we can run in a bus and just have a gas along the way. It's just a really great informal environment. Team MassMart uses this cooperative environment to become more savvy competitors as well. And then, you know, obviously we, we share training ideas. We share ideas about race strategy. So I'll say, hey, look at this, comrades. This was my experience and my take home was this. Use it, don't use it. You know, so we, we really just try to, the, the idea is that we should be able to learn from each other's mistakes instead of making our own. Because if we can learn from each other, then we will progress much faster. Now, all this feel-good, cooperative, mutually supportive camaraderie all sounds quite lovely. But let's not forget there's a larger goal, getting results, better placing, and faster times. For the runners in the mentorship program and set up reasonable expectations. Let's coach you for a year and see if there's a change. And every single mentee that we've included in the team has improved drastically. Breaking into the elite ranks is a slightly taller order and requires even more experience, dedication, training, and consistency. But this was also the point of why the team was founded in the first place. And they've all proven themselves. They've all come up and qualified as elites in their own rights, you know, over the last year to 18 months. And the team produced results in a much shorter period of time, too. At the 2018 Two Oceans, which took place less than six months after the team was formed, MassMart was the second-placed elite women's team in the team competition, which factors in the combined times of team members. In other words, it speaks to multiple people on a team running fast. At the 2018 Comrades, a few months later, Team MassMart won the elite women's team competition. That was achieved with outstanding individual performances, including Anne's incredible victory there, as well as three top 20 finishers from team members, Mia Morrison, Annie Manzini, and Nandi Zalumis. I talk about Anne's victory in detail in her episode. Now, this isn't to say that all of the athletes were so quick to adopt the team's approach to training and racing. As was the case when Anne and team member Eni noticed how things were going for Ramadamicha Babili, who goes by Lizzie. Lizzie, um, I, I raced against her in 2017 and just saw that she was so young and had so much talent. And I thought, wow, you know, this is an athlete who really needs a helping hand to reach her full potential. And we had Lizzie, she was one of the founding elite athletes that that started with us in 2017 and didn't really make the most of her opportunities she just kind of happy-go-lucky continued on her way and didn't make great gains you know in, in terms of her running and then any and I had a word <laughs> and we said you know Lizzie you've got so much potential you really need to make the most of it because this can change your life and she really took it to heart one big change Lizzie made was to stop over racing. She was one of those athletes who was doing a lot of small races because it was a way to earn money. Anne and Annie were asking Lizzie to stop tiring herself out going after these small amounts of cash and save herself for bigger races where, yes, the competition was much more stiff, but the prize money was much better. Also to know, the athletes' financial retainers were tied to performance. So there was potential for Lizzie to not only win better prize money, but also receive more support from the team. But of course, this all requires a big leap of faith. Lizzie knew she could earn money, however little it was, at these less competitive races, but shooting for faster times and better placings at the bigger events was still an unknown. Within a period of four months, 
took her marathon time down from a 3.06 to a 2.55, which that's quite a huge improvement in a short period of time. And then ran, she ran in the top 20 at the two oceans uh, a couple of weeks later and was then hooked. And you could see that then she was convinced, okay, if I really apply myself, things can change. Lizzie did continue to apply herself, and over time, things continued to change. She's within the top three black South Africans over the marathon distance now, and her um, the, the retainer that she's able to earn based on her marathon time as an elite athlete is more than she earns in her private life, you know, as her, as her private source of income with the result that she's able to now support her children more proficiently. She's able to send money to, to her kids who do not live with her in Johannesburg. Um, she's been able to uplift herself from living um, in a township. She now lives in a, in a house. You know, she's just uplifted her circumstances and improved the lives of her children and, and improved her running hugely in the last 18 months. And then finally was selected to represent South Africa at the World 50K Champ, something that she'd never, ever thought that she could do. And all of, the, all of this has happened because she's been encouraged and supported by a team like Team Mascot, which helped her to reach her full potential. And that's life-changing for her. And it's of such benefit to South Africa, um, just in terms of her inspiring other black female athletes in South Africa, particularly in ultra-distance events. In 2019, Lizzie was the top performing athlete on the team. And at only 28 years old, she's just coming into her prime as an ultra-runner. She's improved her marathon time by another six minutes, taking it down to 2.49, and has competed in two international marathons, Amsterdam and Dubai. In 2019, she placed 10th at Two Oceans, and her comrades' time improved by over an hour between her debut in 2018 and second running in 2019. You'll also notice that Anne mentioned the significance of Lizzie, who is Black, inspiring other Black South African female runners. While on the men's side of the sport, both black and white long-distance runners have been among the most successful, and Comrades has been won by a black South African man on numerous occasions. But this is not the case on the women's side. There has never been a black female South African winner of Comrades, and with her 10th place finish at the 2019 Two Oceans, Lizzie was the first black South African woman to cross the line. Lizzie's trajectory is inspiring, but she's far from the only one on Team MassMart to see massive gains in the past several years in both personal and running life. Anne's gamble to raise up sub-elite runners to the elite ranks has generated success story after success story. Any Manzini, who is a firefighter and single mother of two, improved her comrade's time by almost an hour and a half between 2017 and 2019, and she ran a sub-three-hour marathon in January 2020 in Dubai. Any was also the top black female finisher at the 2019 Comrades, coming in 19th. Any and Lizzie are now among the top 10 best black female marathon runners in South Africa. And then there's runner Jenny Cruz, the oldest athlete on the team, at 46. In 2019, she earned her first silver medal at Comrades. This medal is given to athletes who finish outside the top 10, but under 7 hours, 30 minutes. An incredible achievement. And Renata Vosloo improved her Comrades time by over 90 minutes between her debut in 2018, when she wasn't yet with Team MassMart, and her 2019 running. She also earned her first silver medal that year. This is all to say, Anne took a very well-calculated chance on the belief that providing steady support and a nurturing all-for-one, one-for-all environment to a group of promising female ultra runners could transform them into a competitive elite team. That there was overlooked talent only in need of the right kind of support to shine and succeed. And it appears she's on to something. 
For any Manzini, she remembers clearly what getting the call from Anne to join the team meant to her. I just love running. If there is someone out there who can see the potential in you, then that really touched me very much. And I will never forget that day because that day it really she changed my life and she, she put hope in me. When I, I was thinking that whatever I'm doing, it was nothing, but for the fact that she, from far, she recognized me, she saw that potential in me, she really motivated me to even do better than what I was doing. Annie's life has definitely changed since the day she got asked to be on the team, and things have continued to get better. You'll hear more about that in her episode, which will be coming out soon. And something Annie notes is that she draws strength from the communal ethos of the team. It is a great experience because you know that you have sisters that are always supporting you. We meet now and then. We share ideas. We'll support each other. Renata Vaslu, whose story you'll also hear in an upcoming episode, echoes this sentiment. Because of this team, I think you're motivated because there's always someone training hard and telling everyone, no, we can all do it. So when one girl feels down, there's two or three others that can motivate. So so it's nice to bounce off the your almost your own securities with a female runner compared to a male because we are the same, whereas guys are just different. And then the other thing is, I don't know, it's like a big sense of community with just the girls. There's a lot of support. And because girls, we are a little bit more emotional. We're a little bit, it's a very caring environment. So I really love it. Throughout the team's progress, which is now almost three years in the making, Anne has remained mindful that transitioning from underdog to champion can create unwanted changes. I didn't want our team to then go back into the old mold of an elite team where there was winner takes all and no sportsmanship. And so our focus has really been that, hey, we're in this together. We've started from nothing. Nobody thought we were worth anything when we started. We weren't we weren't classified as elites from the beginning, but now we are. But that doesn't mean we have to behave like elites. We need to behave in a in a collegial manner and we need to act in our in our mutual best interests and to inspire and motivate and uplift each other and that's really the ethos of the team and for Anne it all comes back to her original intent and when I see what we do at Team Mass Mart yielding results and changing lives that's really all I need to know that I've made a difference that the team is making a difference whether it's in one person's individual life or whether it's in South African ultra distance running more widely, that's enough and it makes it all worth it. Now in 2020, Team MassMart is made up of 25 athletes, 12 elite runners and 13 sub-elite runners. MassMart's current commitment to support the team is up for renewal at the end of October this year. Anne has great optimism that the sponsorship will be renewed because, as she says, um, and MassMart is, is not yet done with uh, helping, helping us save uh, ultra-distance running in South Africa. Certainly, we echo these same hopes that Team MassMart will be able to continue fostering elite as well as sub-elite women long-distance runners in South Africa and finding success both on and off the race course. And with that, we conclude our story about Team MassMart. To learn more about the team, please visit teamashworth.co.za slash team hyphen MassMart. You can also keep up with the team by following them on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Their handle is at Team MassMart. All links will be in the show notes for this episode. You can find the show notes as well as more information about this episode and about Strides Forward on the website, stridesforwardpodcast.com. There, you will also find the ever-growing Runner Resources page, a list of blogs, books, podcasts, and newsletters that are created by women or focused on women or both. 
These resources are mostly running centric with a few that address women in sports or female athletes more generally. In every episode, I highlight one of those resources. And for this episode, the highlighted resource is Run the North, a weekly newsletter about Canadian running created by Aaron Balzer. Erin provides up-to-date information about what's going on in the sport in her country, as well as news that affects Canadian racers, notable news from elsewhere, historic information, and more. The newsletter is well-researched, insightful, thoughtful, and offers a good mix of information that I find informative, interesting, and oftentimes just straight-up fun. One recent story I really enjoyed was Erin's look back at 1980 Canadian Boston Marathon winner Jacqueline Garreau, who was in the April 20th edition of the newsletter, the day this year's Boston had been scheduled for. And in the May 4th newsletter, Erin offered up 72 books about running that you can check out. You can subscribe to Run the North through the website runthenorth.substack.com which I'll also link to in the show notes. If you have any suggestions for the resources page, please contact me. I can always be reached through the website, or you can find me on Twitter and Instagram, at Strides Forward. Thank you to Anne Ashworth for sharing the story about Team MassMart, and also to Annie Manzini and Renata Vosloo for their input. And thank you to the Strides Forward team, whose voices you experience in other ways on this podcast. There's Cormac O'Regan, who makes all the music you hear and does the sound design. There's also April Mariner of Bonfire Collaborative. She keeps the podcast branding and website looking amazing. You can find April at bonfirecollaborative.com. And thank you to you, the listener. I appreciate all the feedback and support. And I really love these stories, and I love knowing that they're making connections with listeners around the world. Please let me know what resonated with you. Until next time, this is Cherie wishing you satisfying strides forward. That strides forward. 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 Hear Her Sports is a podcast for everyone who loves stories by and about women striving to improve and make a difference in their lives. I am your host, Elizabeth Emery, a former professional cyclist. In every episode, I introduce a female athlete or woman in the business of sport through a thoughtful conversation about who they are and the terrific work they're doing. My guests and I explore the glorious and frustrating issues in sports, history, equity, training, nutrition, and so much more. Join us for inspiration, for community, and for love of being a strong athletic woman.